The body code is an incredibly simple but unbelievably powerful form of energy healing. And its creator, Dr. Bradley Nelson, joins me to talk about the roots of the body code and some clarifications about it and what the ideal length of a session is. We talk about muscle testing and some key energy healing principles. We think about what the future of healing might look like and we get an early preview of the new belief code set to be added to the body code in early 2023. So Dr. Brad, thank you so much for uh, joining me. And congratulations, by the way, because I hear that um, there are now 10,000 um, body code, emotion code practitioners around the world. How do you feel when you see that something that you've created is touching so many people? Well, it's really amazing. <laughs> it's, it's kind of been a wild ride, Mr. Toad's wild ride from the very beginning, really. And, um, you know, it's like, it's like I tell people, it's, uh, it's not about me. I just work here. Um, I'm just doing what I am supposed to be doing. Uh, you know, I really literally am on, uh, am on a mission, you know, from the higher power to, to bring this into the world. It's so interesting because, you know, I had that, I had that experience when I was trying to figure out what to do with my life back in, uh, it was in, I think in 1983, the winter of 1983, 84. And, um, and, you know, I was praying about what to do and, um, you know, you probably heard the story and then I, you know, I actually heard a voice that said to me, this is a sacred calling. So that was kind of like, it, it was kind of like the higher power was offering this to me saying, okay, you can do this if you want. Um, it's a sacred calling. It's up to you. So I chose to do it. And at the time, of course, I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> no idea at all. Um, but, uh, you know, as time has gone on, I've realized, wow, this is uh, this is really an amazing thing. You know, every uh, every Monday morning we meet as a company and uh, online, of course, because our company is in the cloud. And uh, we always try to read um, three of the latest testimonials. You know, we have 10,000 plus testimonials that have come in, but um, we try to post one every day so it doesn't get overwhelming. And then uh, we, we try to read three of those on our meeting. And, um, you know, it's just... Uh, it's just so amazing. You know very well, you know what's going on uh, with this work. Is it's just um, it's really so incredibly powerful, and people's lives are changing all over the world. And it's a humbling thing for me, you know, to even be involved in. It. I'm grateful to have a job. Um, so you so you did create the body code, uh, in which includes the emotion code and also the belief code, which we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, what went into that? You know, I mean, what, what other traditions did it draw on? You talked about the chiropractic, but I think you must have looked much wider than that. Well, you know, um, I was uh, I had some really fascinating experiences that I talk about in the in the new book, The Body Code, which is coming out um, in February, by the way. I don't know if you can see it, but. Um, so some of those experiences are really, really, really powerful. For example, um, and they had to do really with uh, with energy. Um, when I graduated from chiropractic school in June of 1988, I went to work for a guy in Montana uh, named Dr. Stan Flagg. And he was an amazing healer. I mean, people would come to him from dis different states and so on. And um, I had a couple of really wild experiences there that opened my mind. Um, one of the, well, I'll tell you what, backing up, when I got married, uh, I've been married 41 years now to Jean, and um, right after we got married, she was really sick. And uh, I mean, I'd, go, I'd, I'd get up and go to work and she would just stay in bed and, and cry because she was so sick. And I didn't know what was wrong with her. I had no idea. And so we actually took her to see this guy, Stan Flagg. And it was really my first exposure, I think, to muscle testing. And he was muscle testing her. She was holding out her arm and he's he's putting different supplements, you know, on her body and testing different things. And uh, and I remember sitting there thinking, OK, this is either a total scam or this is brilliant. Right. And um, so she ended up with a couple of boxes of supplements to take and instructions. And we went home and within a week, she 
totally pulled out of that and was completely well. And so that was that was kind of my first exposure. So then when I got graduated from school, I went to work for this guy. And uh, I had a couple of crazy experiences that I tell about in the Body Code book. One of them, um, I had, uh, it was in the summer. This is the summer of 1988. And uh, I had a fish sandwich that I was going to eat for lunch. And I, I don't know, <laughs> this sounds really stupid, but it was in my car. And uh, so lunchtime came around and I ate this sandwich and I thought, yeah, I hope this is okay. Well, it wasn't okay. And, and I, within about an hour, I started getting sick and I could just feel it coming on. I knew this was going to be bad. And uh, so I told Dr. Flagg, I said, listen, I have to go home because I'm going to be really sick here in about a half an hour. And he said, well, let's work on you. And so he did, and he did some, uh, he did some energy things, which are kind of things that we do now in the body code, of course. And, uh, and it was so crazy because it, it was like, it was like a hole opened up in the floor sort of. I mean, it was weird. It was just like all this energy came just roaring back into my body from my feet to the top of my head. It came through my feet and just whoosh. And I was instantly better. And, uh, and I burst out laughing and I said, okay, let's get back to work then. Um, another crazy experience that I had working with him that I talk about in the body code was um, a woman came in to see us one day and uh, she had her whole family with her and she was in a wheelchair. And uh, I mean, she looked like death warmed over. She could barely hold up her head. She just looked pale. And uh, she'd been to the hospital and been to see doctors and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. This, this had been going on for about, I think about three weeks or so, maybe a month. Anyway, um, she said that, um, you know, she had absolutely no energy at all. The only time, and she had lots of pain in her body, but she just felt horrible. And she said the only time that she felt halfway decent was when she was in a tub of really hot water, but it took her whole family to get her out again because she had absolutely no energy and uh, was really sick. And they had no idea what was wrong with her at the hospital. And so uh, so we started working with her and I'm taking notes for Dr. Flagg. And um, he finds out somehow through intuition that um, there's a spider bite that is involved with this. And he, he asks her, about it and she doesn't remember. And then she remembers, yeah, okay, a couple of weeks ago or a couple of weeks before she got sick, she did get a spider bite and that was it. So um, so anyway, so Dr. Flagg treats her energetically and um, she leaves with her family in the wheelchair. So this is, uh, she was our last patient uh, that Friday in the summer of 1988. And then Monday morning, um, I come into the office like eight o'clock and uh, there's this woman sitting in the waiting room and I walk over to her and I start talking with her and she looks familiar and I can't place her, but I'm thinking, gosh, who is this woman? She looks so familiar. And then all of a sudden it dawns on me. It's the same woman, no wheelchair, no family. I mean, no ashen skin. She looks totally healthy. And uh, the two of us cried together. I mean, so those were some of the experiences that I had early on, right when I got out of school. And so um, experiences like that really started opening my mind and, you know, to the fact that um, there's more out there, there's more available for us. And then really a key to it was prayer, because, of course, as you know, um, as I was putting together the body code, all I was trying to do was just figure out what was wrong with my patients. And uh, as time went on, the people that I was seeing, um, you know, they became more and more difficult cases, really, as my skills increased. And so the last 10 years that I was in practice, most of the people that I saw had been told there was really no hope for them at all. And um, and yet, you know, the vast majority of them were able to get well. And it was really such a fascinating thing because, um, because I really learned from Dr. Flagg that, um, that muscle testing is a way to access the internal system. Now I'd been a computer programmer, right? And so when I went to chiropractic school, when my instructors would say things like, wow, oh, the brain is the most amazing computer in the, in the you know known world, I would think, wow, it's a computer. Will we ever have the ability to tap into it and get information out of it, right? And, uh, and so then having these experiences with Dr. Flagg started opening my mind to the idea, you know, maybe we can access more about what's going on. And, um, maybe there's a way to do this. And so, um, so yeah, so that's what the body code is really about. I mean, as you know, it works and it's, it's going to, it's destined to change the world. Um, 
I believe. You know, I've done seminars all over the world and so many times people have come up to me and they've told me that, you know, they had a vision or they had a near-death experience or a dream or whatever, and they saw this work change the world. I think that um, um, the beauty of this is that it's so simple that anybody can do it. And um, and really, I think that that's, that's because it's it's come from above and and, you know, our father in heaven knows better ways to do things as long as our ego doesn't get involved, see? And that was another interesting thing um, that I saw when I first got into practice, um, there were a couple of really interesting methodologies that came out, you know, healing techniques that came out that I studied. And what I noticed is that as the years went by, they became more and more and more complex to a point where it just became crazily complex to use these systems. And so I discarded them. And, um, and that's the ego. The ego always wants to make things more complicated, right? Because the ego wants to say, wow, you know, look at me, I can do this. And um, I'm like a rocket scientist and you're not, you can't possibly do this because I'm so smart. You know, that's the ego. And so, but my ego is not in this. Um, and, you know, I've told our practitioners many times, you know, if, you're, uh, if your ego starts to get involved, then at that moment, you cut yourself off from the source of your power because the source of your power is God, our father, the creator. And um, if you can stay humble enough, in spite of all the amazing things that are happening with your friends and your clients that you're working with, if you can stay humble and, uh, and you know, people are going to thank you and that's fine. And you, you, you take those thanks, but then after graciously accepting those thanks, you, you pass those on really to the source because that's, uh, that's really where it all comes from. Yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Just, it feels like that's really key. And I, I was sharing with you just before we came on that, um, you know, I, I get this all the time. Clients have huge breakthroughs, especially with physical pain during the session itself in front of me with just a few minutes work. And mm -hmm. many of them are just like, okay, the pain's gone now, let's move on. But me, who's seen this many, many times, it's like it's the first time for me every time. I'm like, wow, seriously, just by me yeah. twiddling my fingers here, you're, you're getting better. That's incredible. Um, that never gets old, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, even for me now, still, sometimes I'll, I'll just think, are you sure? Really? It's gone all the way. You better check. Just walk yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it's just coincidence and it would have got better anyway at just <laughs> at this exact moment. Um, yeah. But I guess the ego can come in in many different ways, can't it? Ego can come into muscle testing if we think we can do everything and we know everything. But I think it can also come in if we lack confidence in ourselves, if we think, oh, I, I, I couldn't possibly be capable of this. Yeah, what, yeah what that's you, right. What would you say to someone who was wanting to learn the emotion code? Because your, your book, The Emotion Code, is a really clear and simple manual for how anybody can really do this as long as they right. can master the muscle testing. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I think that um, there, first of all, there are some tips about muscle testing that I try to give in the emotion code book, but that people often miss. One of those tips is that um, most people use way too much force. And so, um, and I, I did when I was doing muscle testing uh, back when I was in practice, I, I mainly used this method and you know, we call this the hand solo method where we're just using one, one finger to test and one hand and my fingers hurt for seven years because I was using what I thought was the correct amount of force um, and resistance. But the more it's an equation, right? That's that's equivalent. The more resistance you use, the more force you have to use, and the more you're going to have pain. So if you can back off on the resistance you're using until it's almost none, then the amount of force you need to use is almost none, and then that doesn't cause pain for you. So. Um, so, you know, those are things that I try to help people with. Uh, if, for example, the amount of force that I use now is uh, if there was a if there was a bug like an ant or a, a ladybug in between my fingers, when I'm muscle testing, it would not kill them. It would not hurt them. So I'm using very little force. Um, another thing that's important is that um, people tend to focus on their fingers and when you do that, it's the same thing as if you are, if you're muscle testing someone uh, and, you know, you have them say, for example, they're holding out their arm. And if you have that person say their name is their name, if, if you, if you're muscle testing them and you stay locked on to their eyes, they're going to go weak every time because it short circuits the, the brain in some way. 
Uh, it's kind of a primitive response. Well, the same thing happens with self muscle testing. If you're trying to do self testing and you're focusing on what your fingers are doing, it just short circuits the whole pro uh, process. So what you have to do is uh, think about the question or think about the person that you're working on and allow the test to take place somewhat out of your focus in the same way that if you're a typist and you're typing along at 150 words a minute, you don't dare think about what your fingers are doing for a split second or uh, you don't dare look at your fingers. They know what they're doing and you just focus on, you know, the document or whatever. And so, uh, so those are a couple of things that, that can be helpful. Another thing is that people can, people don't have to use muscle testing. People can use a pendulum. Um, they can use a dowsing, any kind of dowsing device uh, will work. Bobbers work fine. I mean, um, a lot of people don't realize that there are things that they can use um, to get answers from the body. Dowsing devices, uh, all they're doing is just magnifying uh, the energetic change that's taking place in the body already. So if, you, if you're really having a hard time muscle testing, um, you can use a pendulum or some other dowsing device. Also, if you're having trouble muscle testing, you might need a session. And so um, you can have somebody work on you, find a practitioner, uh, they can come to you and ask specifically, um, is there some kind of a trapped emotion or some imbalance in the way of me being able to muscle test efficiently? And oftentimes a session like that can really make a difference too. I, I, this is what happened to me. It's like when I started my business, I had my first client booked in two days ahead and I realized that I could only do the sway test, which is gonna be rubbish on a Zoom call because um, it's about standing up and going backwards and forwards and it takes a lot of time. And I started to panic. Um, so the next day I did a big session on myself using the sway test to unlock my ability to muscle test using the fingers. The next morning I was sitting on a train and I, I did sessions on five people just without standing up, just using my fingers. It really works. Cool. Isn't that how, great? How important do you think the accuracy, because that's where people have doubts on the accuracy. And I want to give you three um, factors and I'd like to ask you to rank them in order of importance to be a good healer. One is the muscle testing accuracy. Second is expertise in terms of anatomy or in terms of protocols. And the third thing is having an intention to heal a person and a connection with that person. How do those three rank? Well, um, the, um, the knowledge of anatomy and so on, that would come in dead last in every case in fact i was teaching a body code seminar recently in um in warsaw in poland and um and i i told everybody i said i was trying to make the point that um the emotion code and especially the body code um work best uh if you don't um if you're not overly educated and relying on your own knowledge so what I told them is the dumber you are, the better this works, okay? <laughs> and it might, it might sound kind of funny, but, but it's actually true. Um, when people have preconceived ideas about what's gonna cause this or what's gonna cause that, that, that's something that they need to actually set aside because you never know what the underlying causes are gonna be, right? You never know. Um, somebody, for example, I was working on just recently, they had a shoulder problem and, uh, it wasn't anything emotional. It was actually a toxin. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, approaching that as a chiropractor, I would have thought, oh, there's a misalignment there, see. Or approaching that just from the point of view of the emotion code, I would have thought, oh, there's a trapped emotion there. But actually it was a toxin. And so you have to just open your mind and allow the subconscious computer system to take you there. So um, so as far as muscle testing goes, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. It's uh, it really comes back to the basics. It comes back to when you're working on somebody, the number one thing that you wanna do, in my opinion and in my experience, I've been doing this for a long, long time now, the number one thing that you wanna do is you wanna ask for help. If you, if you can wrap your mind around the idea or just even begin to wrap your mind around the idea that there could be a higher power, a creator, um, you might need to set aside the things that you learned when you were young that that God is this, like an angry parent or this vengeful God, you got to set aside all of that and, and instead realize uh, that the truth about the creator is that uh, 
is that he has absolutely nothing but perfect unconditional love for us, for each one of us. That love fills the universe. And that love is not changeable. It doesn't change for us no matter what we've done in our lives, no matter what we have done, no matter all the mistakes that we have made. And I know this for a fact because I've had these experiences that have taught me this, that that love of, of God's for us is like a constant in the universe. It's like gravity. Uh, it's like the number pi. Um, it, it doesn't change. And so you have to realize that that um, your father, you have a father above who loves you and he absolutely adores you and wants nothing but success for you. OK, so when you're asking for help, all you're doing and that and that's not an elaborate kind of thing. It can just be as simple as just thinking about it and, you know, maybe thinking, hey, I could use some help here or, or just the word help or whatever. Um, when you do that, though, that opens that conduit for you. And then you need to remember also that um, that every time you do that, I believe that there are angels that come in that are there to help you, help you to work on that person that you're working on or help you to help yourself if you're working on yourself. And so then what you need to do is you need to be open to listening because the answers that come to us through our little intuitions, our, uh, our thoughts, a sudden, you know, you might have a feeling or an idea. Those, I think, when you're in this state, when you've asked for help and you've got angels with you now, and I think that happens every single time, uh, those answers come from those angels. And they come as those really subtle little ideas. And um, I know that you've had the experience uh, working with people where a split second before you get the answer on muscle testing, it appears, right? And that's that intuition of yours. And, and you know, if you um, if you follow that and you cultivate that, you can get to a point where you really don't need muscle testing anymore. Um, then I mean, my daughter, she was she learned how to do muscle testing when she was 13. And after about a month of working on her friends and family members, she came to me. She said, Dad, I don't I don't really need muscle testing because the answers are just there for me. And I thought, oh, that's super annoying. <laughs> OK, yeah. fine. <laughs> no, that's great. And I guess it goes back as well to the thing that you said at the beginning that I love. You say often, um, I just work here. It's like, you know, it's like I don't um, I don't know anything. It's having that attitude. I, I don't know anything. I need help to be able to do this because within me, exactly. without that help, I don't have the capacity to do it. I don't have the capability to do this work. And it's maintaining yeah. that. Yeah. And do you think that's because what, what I find is often that muscle testing works brilliantly to get these healing results. However, when you start to muscle test for curiosity, it's much less reliable. Do you find that? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, you know, when I was first learning about muscle testing, I remember um, a friend of mine and I were talking about this and thinking about how, wow, all the answers are out there in the universe and universal intelligence. And if we can tune into the right frequency, we should be able to figure out the winning lotto numbers because they've really already <laughs> yeah. happened. You know, the future and the past are all the same. And of course, it didn't work. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing I'm asked sometimes as well. Are we tapping into the subconscious mind that knows all about us or the superconscious mind that knows everything about everything? Well, I think that um, I think it's really both. Um, I think that, um, you know, I remember once I, I was working on a patient and uh, I was trying to get answers from their subconscious mind and I was kind of running into a roadblock. And so I thought, well, hmm, okay, um, God knows all the answers. And so, uh, and so I think that it's kind of a combination of things. When, you're, when you ask for help, then for sure um, that help becomes available to you. If you don't ask for it, it's not available to you. So I don't know why in the world you wouldn't ask for it, right? And the power that the knowledge that created everything um, that you know we can't even begin to comprehend. I mean, these bodies of ours are really uh, energy, uh, right? We consist of all these, you know, countless subatomic particles and energies that are all flying in formation. You know, so every moment of our lives is a miracle. It's a miracle one moment to the next moment. Every single moment is a miracle. All of our lives, and so um, you know, there there are of course divine reasons for that um, that are really you know, really fun and really interesting. And I mean, the, the future for all of us, I think is just absolutely incredibly incomprehensibly bright for all of us. Um, 
And, you know, one of the nice things about that, I think, uh, with this work is that um, when you, well, I've had many people who've told me that that um, they never used to pray. They never used to try to get any help from the higher power. They, they didn't believe in a higher power or they just didn't think they could get any help. But that's one of the really nice things about this work is that I've had many people who've told me, wow, you know, I'm kind of in a state of prayer all day long because I'm seeing patients or I'm, I'm working with clients all day long remotely or whatever. And I, I ask for help with each one. And um, I think that's really, that's of all the things I think, um, you know, the love you want to have in your heart for that person, the gratitude that this is going to work um, and asking for help. To me, those are the three most critical components. Yeah. Because if you got a, a heart full of love for the person that you're working on, there's not going to be any doubt in there. And see, the doubt comes in to play when that's when we start having trouble with the muscle test, yes. right? Because we're doubting ourselves. We're doubting our answers instead of just having a heart full of love. And the heart, um, it's kind of like, I mean, the heart is a muscle, but that uh, our ability to love is also like a muscle. And so the more we exercise that, and as we try to work with other people and we're trying to really truly come from a place of love and, and really help them, that love that we have for them is instantaneously communicated to their heart and understood perfectly. And so you can't lie to a person's subconscious mind, see? If you're focused on their money or if, if you're just doing this because you know of some other reason, believe me, they know that on a subconscious level. But when you approach a person and you're coming from a place of pure love, really, that you just want to help them and uh, that you're, you're willing to do whatever it takes to do that, to help them, when you come from that place, that love of yours is understood in their heart and the barriers fall down. And so then things that might not otherwise be findable become findable for you because now they're open to you, see? So um, I think those are all those are all really important things. Uh, I, I think you can, I mean, if you really wanna be a really powerful healer, um, you can, I mean, everybody in the whole world has that ability. Every single man, woman, and child on the planet has that, that innate gift, that birthright belongs to all of us. But it's really all about love, see? It's love that opens the doors. And um, and as you do this work, I think uh, that's one of the really neat side effects of this work. It's right. Have you noticed that, Guy? Yeah, 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 definitely. Your ability to love gets bigger and uh, increases. And what a cool thing, you know, because, um, you know, when we die and we go to the other side, we only take with us a couple things. I mean, all of our material things are left behind. We bring with us the knowledge we've gained and our ability to love. And the more ability we have gained to love others, the more we have become like our Father in heaven. The more we have become like Christ, the more we have, the more we have become ascended. And the more love we're capable of, the better off we are when we pass on to the next world. And we all do eventually. There's not much else that we can take with us, is there? <laughs> I think that's that. pretty much it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if we're in that condition, if we're in that loving condition, would you say that that's, that's the healing, basically? That takes care of everything else. The muscle testing works because we're in that condition. The results happen because we're in that condition. That that condition is the powerhouse of the work. Yeah, I think that um, I think there's so much. Uh, it's just such a high energy and we all desire it so much. And we all, I believe, came from a place of unconditional perfect love, right? You know, there was a, um, there was a YouTube um, video that I saw. I've never been able to find it again, but if I find it, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, it was an emergency room doctor and he was talking, he was being interviewed and he was talking about how, you know, um, in the movies and on TV, when somebody dies and they flatline, you know, with no heartbeat, they bring in the paddles, you know, clear, boom, and they hit him with the paddles. Um, he said that it's not like it is in the movies and on TV. He said, um, most of the time, those people don't come back. He said only about 15% of the time can they rescue those people and, and get a heartbeat back. The rest of the time, they're just dead. They're gone. And he said, um, one day in the ER, something really crazy happened. He said they had three different people that they brought back. And this day, he said, changed his whole life because when because they all said the same thing, basically. They all said, 
first of all, why did you bring me back? They didn't want to be brought back. And then the second thing that they all basically said was that for the first time in their whole existence, when they died and they went to the other side, they felt totally accepted. They felt totally accepted. And I've thought about this and thought about this. And, you know, the reason why they felt totally accepted when they died and went to the other side is because they were in this suddenly in this field of unconditional love. Right. And so total acceptance is the fruit of unconditional love. See, and so our ability to love others unconditionally, that's the kind of love that God has for us. It's not conditional. He doesn't love you differently today or less today because of what you did last night. No, it's the same all the time. And so, so as we get rid of our emotional baggage and as we get rid of our heart wall and as we, um, as we clear out all of this baggage and all these other imbalances that we have, we ascend in vibration and we become more capable of that unconditional love, see? And so we become degree by degree, little bit by little bit, we become more like God. We become more like the father of us all who created us all and um, who wants to share everything that he has with us, see? And so there are divine reasons for the, you know, for us being here in this world. And um, it's, uh, it's just so amazing, you know, yeah. to me to think about it and to think how this work, I had really had no idea how this work was going to change lives around the world, but it's, it's not only helping people physically, as you know, but also emotionally. And it's also unlocking people's ability, see, to love. And that's of course where the heart wall comes in, in such a big way. Because yeah. when that wall comes down, you know, all kinds of things happen, right? I'm sure you've got a lot of great stories about people finding love, falling in love. I mean, in fact, we have a research study that we're doing right now. We're just we're just finishing it up where um, we took, uh, we had about 600 people, in two groups that were all um, uh, not in a relationship, but that wanted to be. And then uh, we split them up into two groups. And then one group had their heart walls cleared and the other group didn't. Okay. And so we're going to see what happens with that study, but we're really excited that it's we should brilliant. have the results from that brilliant. in a couple of weeks. With, with me, it's like I, I almost gave up on the emotion code because I'd heard all of these stories. And on, on the day when I released the last trapped emotion from my heart wall, I expected my life to change and it didn't. And I was like, well, this is rubbish. I'm going to give this up. Um, but it was only <laughs> a few months later, actually, that I looked back um, over my life and there'd been such a dramatic change from when I released my heart wall. But it had just yeah. happened in such small steps that I didn't yeah. notice it until I looked down from the from where I got to. Sure, and that that's how it happens sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's gradual, and uh, people ask me all the time about you know what's going to happen when my heart muscles release. I never know. Um, sometimes those results happen immediately. Sometimes they take place over time, and sometimes it's it's subtle enough that you don't really <laughs> notice anything until you look back. Yeah. So this condition of love, I mean, you're talking about. I mean, do you foresee a time? I mean, you talked earlier about your daughter able to muscle test without muscle testing, you know, able to get intuition uh -huh. without muscle testing. Do you foresee yeah. a time where more elements of what we use now fall away and that condition of, of love and connection in itself will be enough to do the work? Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually do. I think that, um, uh, well, as, as a devout Christian, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And um, I believe that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. He was the son of God. He came to teach us all about love, right? And uh, and I believe that he he's going to come back. And all of those prophecies about a thousand years um, of you know perfect peace and harmony in this world, uh, that's, I believe, right around the corner. Um, it's coming. And I think that that's why gifts like the emotion code are coming into the world to help us because, I mean, if you think about it, darkness and dark forces have had tremendous sway and have kept mankind in basically some state of slavery of one kind or another since the very beginning. And you look at what's going on now, you know, with pandemics and, you know, all kinds of things that are being cooked up and, you know, we're lied to from the moment that we're born. And, and uh, the thing is, what's happening now, guys, that the consciousness of the world is expanding. And every single day, I believe, 
the consciousness of the world is a little bigger than it was the day before, see? And so there's no going back. And so what we see going on in the world right now is this incredible turmoil and these, these ancient power structures that have held mankind in slavery for all these centuries, um, you know, they're, they're desperate to hold on to their power, see? And so we see all this craziness going on. Well, that's what's happening. It's the yin and the yang, it's the light and the dark, that um that are just you know kind of battling it out right before our eyes but eventually all the prophecies from uh, from all of mankind's history about the era that we're moving towards every single one of them without without exception are all incredibly positive yeah we're gonna have to go through some you know some difficulties but eventually we're we're going to emerge into a world that um it's going to be beyond our ability. I mean, it's beyond our ability right now to comprehend. It's going to be so, so incredible. I mean, imagine living in a world where everyone's living from their heart, yeah. where there is no darkness anymore. Um, that's where we're going. Um, darkness eventually is going to be, it's going to disappear. And it's, it's because of our own individual ascensions, right? Rising in vibration, becoming vehicles of unconditional love, and um, that's what's going to change the world. And eventually uh, the darkness just won't have a place anymore because nobody's going to want to choose it anymore. So that's kind of how I look at things. Sorry, I kind of went off there. No, that's beautiful. That's really... <laughs> but I'm going to bring us back just a little bit now to the, to the body code itself because I want to talk about the belief code in a moment. But, okay. but there's a couple of questions that I'm asked quite often. And I, I think the number one one is, you know, when, when you do the body code, an imbalance will come up and then there'll be one or more imbalances associated it, with it, maybe a trapped emotion or something like that. Um, and the question I'm asked more most often is what's the exact relationship between the imbalance that we start with and what we come to? So, for example, let's say we start with a sickness memory from when uh -huh. we were 42. And then the uh -huh. thing that comes next is a trapped emotion from the age of 25, which was way before that. How is it possible? In what way are they related? Does it mean that I felt that emotion during the, how are they related? Well, um, some, I mean, a lot of the time we, we don't really know how things are related or how things are connected. The subconscious mind is a very, very deep well, right? And so, um, so we don't always know uh, what the connections are, but, I'm okay with that. Um, and I, I think it's it's okay to be okay with that because um, because the subconscious mind has all the answers and we we're kind of like the operators uh, of this, you know when we, when we use the body code, um, it's like we're we're children, you know that are just barely learning how to work on this computer that's the size of Mount Everest, right? And we get answers. And now we can use the body code to get those answers. How things are connected, we don't really know necessarily sometimes. A lot of the time we don't know. Like for example, um, let's say that somebody has a, um, I've seen this before where someone will have maybe a viral infection in the body. And if I ask if there's something associated, I might find a trapped emotion. And um, and it, it, it's become clear to me over time that sometimes certain kinds of energies like trapped emotions can somehow in some way, um, anchor some other imbalance into the body so that that imbalance can't be released until and unless that anchor is removed, that trapped emotion or whatever it is. I've seen that with infections. I've seen it with toxins, lots of different things. So um, exactly why is it happening? Well, I don't know. You can think about that for a long time. If you figure it out, let me know. It, well, it goes back to I just work here, doesn't it? That that sort of covers <laughs> covers everything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why do exactly. we need to know? We we just need to know that that it will work, and that's it, isn't it? Yeah. I used to sometimes tell my patients. <laughs> sometimes I can remember. Um, sometimes I get a new patient, and, and sometimes I'd say to them, you know, I'm basically clueless <laughs> about what's wrong with you, yeah. and they would look at me like, oh, what am I doing here? And I'd say, well, no, it's okay. Your subconscious mind knows all the answers and I know how to talk to it. <laughs> Brilliant. And I want to ask you a bit about ses session length as well. And I'll use my experience to, to, for this. So when I started, I, I did 50 minute sessions and mm -hmm. I work quite fast as well. So we covered a huge amount of imbalances in those sessions. 
And what I found was that, you know, we could go to the end for each person. Nobody's body said that's enough. And every time we had an imbalance, um, there were like maybe eight or nine imbalances um, associated with it. There were these huge chunks. And the clients were very happy because they were getting all this work done. But I had a yeah. feeling at some point, well, this isn't right. This isn't optimal. This isn't working yeah. the best way it could. So as a next step, I went down to 40 minutes for a session. I went mm -hmm. from 50 minutes to 40. Uh -huh. and what I found, I found a number of things when that happened. First thing I found was that um, the groups of imbalances became much short, much smaller. So you'd get an imbalance mm -hmm. and maybe just a trapped emotion or just a couple of things associated mm -hmm. with it. Um, people maxed out much earlier in the session. So mm -hmm. maybe after 20 minutes or 30 minutes, their body said that's enough. Um, right. And I was sort of thinking, do you know what? I, I, maybe I'm shortchanging people here. I'm, I'm giving them less. But what I found was that the results that people got from these shorter sessions where fewer um, imbalances were released were much better than the longer yeah. ones with loads. And now I'm wanting yeah. to go down to 30 minutes again. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a big, you know, sure. it's a big thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put it to my clients and see what how they feel about it. But to go down to 30 minutes with, you know, just on the under, it, because it's starting to feel like 40 minutes is too long now. And I wonder yeah. what your thoughts are about this and how you might explain the fact that sometimes releasing fewer things leads to better results. Right, exactly. Well, um, if you um, if you think about the early days of uh, of the U.S. Um, back in the 1800s, when in the in the western part of the U.S. we had forests that covered you know, hundreds of millions of acres, um, and they were doing logging. There were people called loggers that would cut down the trees, and they would they'd cut all the branches off of a tree that had been felled, and then they'd roll it down to the river. And they would have all these logs in the river, hundreds of thousands of logs sometimes would get stuck and they would form what they called a log jam. Well, there were special loggers whose job was to look at the log jam and identify the what they called the key log. And the key log was one log or sometimes two or three that if removed would allow all the other logs to start flowing down the river again. And this is costing them money, right? Every, you know, every hour that goes by, all the logs are stuck and sometimes these would, these would go for miles. Well, um, I always try to have a uh, uh, an intention that I want the biggest imbalance. I want I want the biggest. I think of it. And sometimes I, I talk about it as the big tuna. Right? What's the biggest fish? What's the biggest imbalance that I can pull out right now and, and correct that will make the most difference for this person? And um, I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind and have that intention um, to do, because what it does then is uh, uh, sometimes I think you, you pull out the most important thing and then other things can start to flow kind of like the log jam in the river. And so um, I think that what eventually will happen to you is you'll get to probably down to 20 minutes, maybe 10. Um, I used to do my sessions in 20 minutes. And what I would do is I would, I'd watch the clock and I would spend the first five minutes just connecting with the person and finding out what's been going on and, you know, talking about their families and whatever. And then as um, soon as that five minutes was over, we would jump right in. And uh, so really I was doing sessions in 15 minutes, yeah. but I found that that was plenty of time to find those imbalances. And, um, and sometimes when I work on people now, I'll just have an intention uh, of, I want to find the three biggest, most, weighty imbalances that I can find right now. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm not doing the practice. I'm, uh, you know, I don't have a practice anymore. I just work on friends and occasional people. And then of course I'm doing events and things. Um, but, um, but that's what I try to do now is I, I try to look for, at least initially to look for the, the three biggest imbalances that I can find. So I think as time goes on, you'll, you'll find out that, um, you know, 20 minutes, a 20 minute session, Plenty of time, plenty of time. And um, yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's good. It's interesting that you're going through that process. Yeah, it, no, it, it's a really interesting process. So when I guess when you clear the log jam, you don't need to clear all of the other stuff because it takes care of itself because the blockage has been re removed. Is that right? Yeah, to, to, yeah, to one degree or another that, that of course is unknown to us. Um, if we have that intention to find the biggest 
tunas, the biggest imbalances we can find, other things will flow. I mean, sometimes certain trapped emotions are, I think, are, are like logs in that log jam. So you, you clear maybe a big trapped emotion and they might actually start to flow down and, and, um, and release by themselves. I think that that can happen. Just like, you know, if you, um, if you go to a massage therapist or you're getting a Reiki treatment or something and all of a sudden you have a spontaneous emotion that's released, well, um, yeah, that can happen, I think. So, you know, if you think about all the imbalances that a person might have going on, the subconscious mind really truly is like a computer. It's like Google. It's, it's far, far beyond Google. It's an, in, incomprehensibly powerful. But um, if we just simply have that intention, um, then I think it can um, it can help us to get things done more efficiently and uh, and help people faster. So why why do you think these these log jams get cleared more easily in the shorter sessions when we're releasing less things than in the longer ones? Where why, why aren't they included in the massive bunch of imbalances we do in the bigger sessions? Well, I think it has to do with the fact that um, that your intention has changed. See, because before your intention was, hey, we got fifty minutes, we got to fill it up right well the subconscious mind of the person you're working on they understand that so it's like well all right um, let's let's give them all these various things but when the time frame changed now what's your intention well we've got to make hay while the sun shines we've only got 40 minutes now so you're going to have to give me more important stuff that was unspoken but um but yet you know it's really interesting yeah i mean you could do sessions in 10 minutes if you wanted to yeah, I mean, I, I do with my family in five or ten minutes uh, when I'm working on them. There you um, go. But then I could I have the luxury of doing them every day, whereas with a client, um, it's not so not so much. Um, no, that is that's really interesting. It's, it's and, and I guess mm -hmm. it's that it's that connection between the healer and the client's subconscious mind that is direct. Yeah. Because you know whatever we think, the healer's going to be thinking if it's a fifty minute session and it ends after thirty minutes, the healer's going to be thinking, oh no, I'm shortchanging them. I was thinking that. And the client's going to be thinking, oh, no, I've been shortchanged. I've paid for a 50 minute session and it's ending after half an hour. Whereas right. if both of that, it, where it's reframed in both cases, then it sort of maybe clears the channel between the minds to be able to come up with the really the most important stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, if you. Um, um, I think 20 minutes is about the ideal time frame, yeah. you know, ultimately, you'll probably get to that point. And um, in 20 minutes, I never had a problem finding whatever needed to be found. And uh, and it's it's just interesting. You're moving in that direction. So keep me posted. Let me know how that goes. I will do. That's great. Um, <laughs> right. To finish with, I want to talk about the new expansion of the body code. So we started with the emotion code. Then it expanded into the into the body code, which included the emotion code. And we've got mm -hmm. a new, um, you know, the, the, the book is coming out about the body code uh, in the new year, I believe. Is that right? Yep. Looks like this. And what is that? What, what is the purpose? So the emotion code was basically an instruction manual for people to be able to do it by themselves. Is this a similar story? Yeah, well, exactly. Um, <clears throat> you know, initially, I'll tell you a little something. We um, the, the first version of the body code that we wrote, um, that I wrote and sent in after I had some help editing it and so on, uh, the publisher got back to me and they said, no, this isn't really hands-on enough because initially what, what I had sent them was kind of an overview of the body code, how it works and the whole theory and everything. And they said, no, what we really want is something more experiential, kind of like the emotion code. We want the body code book to be a companion volume to the emotion code where people can actually use the book and learn how to do it. And I said to them, well, the problem is the body code if we were to put everything into the book, I mean, the book would be about this thick. Yeah. Nobody wants to read a book that thick. And so what we did is we, um, we took out the most important things, the most common things that we would find with people, and we put those in here. And so the idea with this book is that people will be able to use this and have success with these principles and these ideas. Mm. Um, so we couldn't possibly include everything, yeah. but we included, you know, the like the top 25 list or whatever you want to call it. I don't know how many are in here, but quite a few, actually, along with all the stories and all the explanations and everything else. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun for people. And um, I think that um, people will be able to use the book and have some success. And then eventually, I think what will happen with most people is that they'll 
they'll end up going to the body code uh, app because it has everything in it. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of exciting. Yeah, it really <laughs> is. And speaking of exciting, tell us about the belief code because this is going to be added to the body code in the new year. Um, right. I know it's really, really eagerly anticipated by so many people. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit yeah. about what the belief code will be and then maybe give us a little taster of it? Well, absolutely. So um, so what happens to us is that we, we develop subconscious <laughs> beliefs and programs and faulty um, faulty core beliefs and things like that. And you can think of a, uh, you can think of a, a, a negative belief system as being like a tree with roots and those roots might be the faulty core belief. Um, like nobody loves me or whatever. And then, then there's a trunk of the tree and that might be limiting beliefs. And then you might have um, negative programs attached to that. Um, and so, um, so basically what the belief code is, is going to be is it's going to be a, um, a very rapid, very easy way for people to identify uh, these subconscious belief systems. Now, we used to do this work uh, and, you know, I mean, years ago, back when I was in practice, we would, we would do this work. And the idea is that a, a belief is a discrete energy in the energy field. And if you can identify that belief, uh, essentially word for word, then you can also delete it magnetically, just like you delete a trapped emotion. Right. And so, um, so the difference here is, is that um, the subconscious mind has its own conclusions and its own beliefs. Those can be dealt with magnetically or energetically and changed. Um, the conscious mind, however, you know, if, if you believe that, um, you know, if you believe that the sky is blue consciously, I can't change that and, and make you believe the sky is some other color or, you know, conscious beliefs are different from subconscious beliefs, but subconscious beliefs are kind of like energetic errors they're like bugs in the system of the computer and so um so i can kind of give you just a really bare bones um uh, idea what this is going to look like yeah. you know in some ways it's going to be a mind mapping system okay and um so uh do you want to uh do you want me to demonstrate this on you that'd be amazing yeah okay let me just grab a, uh, I'm just gonna grab a little notepad window here. Okay, all right. Okay, so cool. So like the body code or like anything else, the first thing that we like to do is take a moment and ask for some help from up above. Here we go. All right, cool. And so uh, next uh, I'll ask, are we connected energetically? Yes or no, we are. Okay, so great. I can act as proxy for you, great. All right, so um, so is there is there any particular area um, well, what, I, what, I, what I've heard yeah. about the belief code, you tell me if this is right or not, is that, you know, one of the things, so I'm really interested in working with trauma. Um, and I find that the body code can bring big changes, but I haven't found anything that can really make a really big shift in terms of trauma, in terms of people's triggers. So okay. if, if, the, if this is the belief code, if the belief code is really good for that, I'd, I'd love to have, because, you know, I, 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 I'm autistic. And like many autistic people, I've had a, you know, a lifetime of, of micro trauma, which still gets triggered, even though there's been a huge change in my, um, in my, you know, how I live, how my experience of life. And especially through the, through doing the body code, what I found is that I get triggered much less often. I, I'm in situations where I get triggered very, very rarely, but when it happens, it's the same, um, it's the same result. And it's usually when uh, it's an interpersonal disagreement when there's some experience of being disrespected or dismissed or or, or willfully misunderstood or something like that, and then yeah. I go into this this involuntary reaction. Okay, all right, all right. So the great thing about uh, about this is that your subconscious mind knows exactly what you're talking about, and so uh, so let's ask this question using the belief code now, and and uh, the belief code is not. There are some some major fundamental pieces that I'm not going to be addressing here. Okay, um, 
what we have right here, what you're seeing is just kind of a, uh, uh, it's kind of a very rudimentary map that we put together while we're doing some testing on this. And just to give you an idea, um, uh, this, this system that we're looking at right now, this test bed basically, uh, has about 900 beliefs in it. Um, and we have about 500 more to add. And, uh, and then I think we're going to be, uh, we're going to be there. So, uh, so this is very, um, what would you call it? Well, this is not what it's going to look like in the end, but anyway, let's see if we can find something. So, um, so let's ask this question. Is there, do you have a negative belief system, um, that has to do with this involuntary reaction that, that you have, that you've described? And the answer is yes. Okay, good. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to look for um, the, the faulty core belief in this system, okay? And so let's look at our chart here and let's ask, okay, this faulty core belief, is it on the left side of this chart? No, so it's on the right side. So is it about higher power or self? It's about self. So we'll click on this one, okay? Now, uh, there are some options here, right? So which one of these is it? Is it one of these on the right side? No. So is it um, self-punishment or self-sabotage? So there's a self-sabotage belief. And is it one of these on the left side? No. So is it I don't deserve blank? I'm not, uh, I'm not worth it. I'm not worth it. Okay. So that's your faulty core belief. Okay. I'm not worth it. Now, do we need to change the wording on this at all? We don't, okay? So that's the exact frequency. So if I were there with you, Guy, if you were to hold out your arm and if you were to actually make this statement, I am not worth it, that would be rock solid, right? Okay, so there's our faulty core belief. All right, now let's see if we've got a, a, any kind of a limiting belief, all right? So we'll go back out to the home page, right? And um, is there a limiting belief in this system? Yes, there could be more than one. Um, this first one, is it something on the right side? It's on the left side. Is it about life situations, health, scarcity? It's about relationships. So we'll click on that one. So is it, uh, is it one of these on the left side of this chart? No. Is it feeling loved? It's feeling loved. Okay. All right. So I'm going to have to expand the map just a little. There we go. And, uh, these will actually be tables in the final product. So that, you know, you, it'll, you'll, it'll be like the emotion code, you know, A, B, C, columns, you know, uh, and then odds and evens and rows. So you'll find it that way. This is a little harder this way. So it's one of these about feeling loved. Um, is it one of these on the left side? No. So it's on the right side. So you see how fast this is, right? <laughs> so is it nobody loves me? Nobody will ever love me? Is it, is it the second one, third one? Is it fourth one? Is it the uh, fifth one, that one? Okay. Um, is it, uh, is it I'm being, I'm always, I'm, I have been rejected. I'm always, I am always rejected. Is that it? Do we need to know more about it? No. Okay. I'm always rejected. Okay. So there's our limiting belief. We'll go back to the homepage now. Okay. So now let's ask, all right. So um, is there another limiting belief in this system? No, okay, is there a negative program? Yeah, there's a negative program. And negative programs and limiting beliefs are, they're very similar, but we identify them a little bit differently. So there's a negative program and what is that? Is it something on the left side of the chart? No. So is it about higher power, spirituality? Is it about self, about life? It's about life, so we'll click that one. And is it about, is it about one of these on the left side or the right? Is it life in general, happiness? It's life in general, okay. All right, so let's see here. So I have to shrink this down a little bit. Is it one of these on the left side? No. You can see how this will be easier to do when we have the columns and rows, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see. Is it one of these from life can't be easy to the top? No. So it's one of these from here down. Is it I don't want to be here. I wish I had a better life. I'm dissatisfied. Doing anything for free. No pain, no gain. In the sweat of my face, people in general are selfish um life's not convenient i'm all alone okay that that said uh is it i am all alone i'm completely on my own i am alone okay do we need to change that wording so you see how the wording can be just a little bit different instead of saying i am all alone it's just i am alone do we need to change that wording at all no okay all right so now let's go back to the home page and let's ask uh all right 
Is there another negative program in this system? No. Um, is there anything else that needs to be released as part of this system? And the answer there is yes. So that takes us to, oh, not there. Let's see, that takes us to, hang on a minute. I need to get to our Discover Healing app. There we go. All right. So there's something else that's part of this system. So this system will be um, when you like if you're using this on your desktop computer, um, it, it's or if you're using it on your phone, it's going to be a separate icon, okay, at the bottom, and um, there will be a certification program that will be available for people, you know, uh, for the belief code. But anyway, it's going to be a separate system, and here's the reason why because there can be other things that we might need to find and clear. So in this case, there is something else related to the system. And is it something on the right side? It's on the left. Is it in energy? It's in energies. Okay. So this system is like a tree, you know, it's, I'm not worth it. And then I'm always rejected and I'm alone. Okay. That's the tree starting from the bottom. And uh, there's something else going on here with this. Is it something on the left side? Is it allergy intolerance? Is it something emotional? Yep, something emotional. So we'll go there. And is it a trapped emotion? And it is. So is it one of these on the left side? Is it a common or shared or absorbed? It's actually an absorbed trapped emotion. Mm -hmm. hmm. So let's see what this is. Uh, is it something in column A? No, it's in B. Is it in one of the odd rows? Uh, yes. Is it in row one or three or five? So is it conflict or creative insecurity? Is it terror or unsupported? It's it's a, a shared or an, sorry, an absorbed trapped emotion um, of uh, unsupported. Hey, do we need to know more about that? We don't. So we'll go ahead and release that one. Okay. And, um, and now let's go back to the homepage here. We can go back to the, we actually can go back to the belief code. We can ask, is there is there anything else in this system that we need to deal with? No. Okay, so let's go ahead and start releasing these. Um, we'll, uh, um, let's see. Let's go ahead and we'll release the faulty core belief. I'm not worth it. Okay, so we'll release that one. And uh, do we release that one? And then the limiting belief, I'm always rejected. We'll release that one. And then the negative program, I'm alone. Um, let's go ahead and release that one. Okay. And so now, um, do you have that faulty core belief? I am not worth it anymore. No. So if you were there and if you were to say, I'm not worth it now, your arm would go weak. Okay. Um, do you still have the limiting belief? I'm always rejected. No. Do you have the negative program? I'm alone. No. Is there anything else about the system that we need to know? No. Now, do you need any positives to be put in? Because sometimes with a system like this, you might have you might have to put in a, a an empowering core belief uh, or a strengthening belief or a positive program. You know, you might have to. Um, and those will also be part of this, okay? So um, anytime you have a table uh, of negatives, you'll also have a table of positives and you'll be able to test for those in case you need those. In this particular case, let's find out, do we need to put in any positives here? We don't actually. So um, we don't need to put in anything else. So that's it. So it was that fast. That that I mean, I want to say that's simple. It's not simple, but it's it's just really quick and easy and yeah. By the looks of it, very, very powerful as well. Yeah. So that's uh that's basically how it works. <laughs> and and Dr. Brad, when is that gonna be available? Well, um it's it's gonna be our third certification level. So um so it will be available hopefully, hopefully by the beginning of the year, end of this year, hopefully. We're working on it. In fact, we're working on it today. Uh, we've been working on it for a while. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty big, pretty complex system, but um, you know, there's a lot more that uh, there's a lot more that we that we need to do, but we're getting very close now to having it done. And so um, so when people go through a motion code certification. That gives them the basics, and then they do body code certification, and um, and then they get 
a lot of, you know, you know, the body code, there's a lot of, uh, it really opens the world up for you. Um, and then to really do the belief code, your system was really simple, but, um, but we really feel that people need to be, they need to really be trained and certified in the body code to be able to really get the belief code and really use it. And, uh, uh, and even though it looks really simple, sometimes there are things that you have, you have to know how to do in the body code. And uh, the emotion code's not enough sometimes. So um, this one, this one on you is pretty simple. It can be, it can be more complex, but it's always really fast. And um, so we're we're trying to make it that we're trying to make it really simple, so that so that I mean, imagine a belief code session shouldn't take you more than twenty minutes. You know, it shouldn't take you any longer than a regular session. Um, and so that's that's the goal and that's the idea. So. Uh, Anyway, yeah. What do you think? I, I'm amazed by it. I, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just looking forward to getting my hands on it as soon as it's available. <laughs> sure. Yep. No worries. Well, we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted. Great. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brad. So, if people want to uh, find out more about the whole, you know, the whole project, I guess, discoverhealing.com. Is that right? Yep. Discoverhealing.com. That's where all the, all the info is. And then, of course, my personal blog is at drbradleynelson.com. Okay. Um, Yep. And we'll put those on the screen Thanks, and we'll guys. put the links in the description as well. Dr. Brad, it's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Have a great day. And thanks, everybody, for listening. I came to Heart for Healing mainly because I had issues with self-esteem, anxiety. I tried counseling. I tried all different types of therapy and they weren't working. And I, I, I was kind of ready to give up. And then I came across uh, Heart for Healing and kind of clicked almost and I was I was skeptical at first and you know I, and then I experienced my first session and it was like instant I felt like results like from the first session how had you changed by the end of them I felt uh, like happier healthier um I felt like I could be more myself I could express myself in with my friends and with other people a lot easier and I came across a lot more calm around situations my anxiety stuff took a dip uh, especially through my exams. Even from the moment the guy connects to you, you feel like the weight is starting to lift and you feel like you're healing yourself from the inside out and it feels amazing.